Hello, I'm Dr. Neil Silverman in UCLA's Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and I also work with my colleagues in the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine, which means we take care of high-risk pregnancies. I've also been appointed as the director of our new program for infectious diseases in obstetrics. And if you are here tuning in, then you, like us, are concerned about the monkeypox virus that we are hearing about, and especially how it might pertain to you and to you if you are thinking about or are already pregnant. So, as many of you might ask, what is monkeypox? What is this that we've heard about and why should we be concerned about it or should we be concerned about it? So monkeypox is a virus created illness. Like many other viruses that can infect our bodies, it can cause a wide range of symptoms and a wide range of effects. Now, the thing that concerns us about monkeypox is that even though it's a relatively new virus for us to be exposed to or to be worried about, it is in the same family of viruses as the disease that causes smallpox, which we know historically caused widespread epidemics and pandemics and significant outbreaks of severe human illness. Now, the monkeypox symptoms are similar to those of smallpox in terms of the blisters, the diffuse discomfort and illness. However, fortunately, the symptoms associated with monkeypox appear to be much milder than those associated with smallpox, and they are rarely fatal. Also, monkeypox does not appear to be as contagious as smallpox was. Smallpox was spread through respiratory transmission so that you could be in the same room as someone who had smallpox and get infected. Monkeypox does not appear to be spread quite as easily casually as smallpox was. And as you'll see, does require much more direct, prolonged physical contact with an infected individual. So, People who develop monkeypox typically will get a rash that can be limited or can spread diffusely across their body with time. It typically starts breaking out around the area that the initial contact occurred so that when these this disease is transmitted through sexual contact, it tends to be located initially near the genitals or on other areas in the genital region, although it can also initially occur in areas like the hands or the feet or the chest or the face or even the mouth. This rash can initially just look like pimples or blisters that are scattered and be mistaken for anything terribly serious although they ultimately become very painful, very much out of proportion to how large they are, and unlike the majority of other rash or blister illnesses, much more uncomfortable, for example, than chicken pox. And this rash will go through several stages so that any given individual can have a variety of maturation levels of these blisters on their body. So it starts as these blisters and then it will go through enlargement and reddening until it gets into a scab stage and then the scab will fall off before that area actually heals. Some people, but not all, will have flu-like symptoms before they develop a rash, but a significant number have reported no symptoms before they develop the rash. And these other symptoms can include fever, swollen lymph nodes or swollen glands, respiratory symptoms, exhaustion, muscle aches, and headache, all of which are very nonspecific symptoms and might not make anyone think that they've contracted monkeypox. Monkeypox symptoms will usually start 
within three weeks of an exposure. And if someone has flu-like symptoms, they will typically start developing the rash anywhere from one to four days after those symptoms have uh, started. Now, monkeypox can spread very extensively across the body, and it can be spread from person to person from the time those symptoms initially show up until the rash has completely healed, all the scabs have crusted over and fallen off, and a fresh layer of skin has formed over the area where the blisters were. And this process can take anywhere from two to four weeks to run its course. So how is monkeypox spread? This is a question we get asked a lot because people think of other diseases that are related to blisters that can be spread fairly easily. Happily, monkeypox is not an easy disease to acquire casually. This requires prolonged, close, or intimate contact and not spread through the air the way the flu or COVID or even chickenpox can be spread through respiratory droplets in the air. Now, it can be spread to anyone. We have seen in the press that the majority of individuals who have developed these infections have prime, predominantly been men who have sex with other men. However, this can be spread from anyone to anyone through close, personal, and often skin-to-skin -skin contact. It requires direct and prolonged contact with the monkeypox rash or scabs or body fluids from a person who's infected. Now, it can also occur through contact with objects that an infected person has also touched or been in contact with themselves, such as clothing or bedding or towels and any other surfaces that they have used because the virus lives in and on the surface of these blisters. So when someone has direct contact with those blisters, whether they know that they are there or not, or with other items in the household, that that person has been in contact with that has rubbed against those blisters, then something like bedding or a towel can transmit the virus even if no formal close physical contact has occurred between the infected person and the person who is with them. The only way that monkeypox appears to be able to be spread through respiratory secretions is when people are very close face to face, such as kissing or cuddling or having that close a degree of physical contact. So this direct contact can happen during sexual encounters. Either oral or anal or vaginal sex can and has been associated with transmission of the virus from one person to another. Although hugging and massage and kissing can also transmit the virus if the contact is prolonged and the infected person has exposed blisters in an area that another person comes into contact with. And again, touching fabrics and objects during sex that were used by a person who has monkeypox or subsequently develops monkeypox but only has mild symptoms is another way to become infected. And it's important to remember that a person with monkeypox can spread it from the time their symptoms start, meaning generalized flu-like symptoms, until the rash has broken out, and up until the time that rash has fully healed, the scabs have crusted over, and new skin has formed over that area. So that can be up to four weeks that many infected individuals can remain infectious in the setting of close contact. So what I have for you now are some images of what the rash actually looks like, because after hearing some of what I've told you, I don't want you all to be very afraid to be in contact or near anybody with any type of rash. The rash associated with monkeypox is very characteristic 
and very specific. First of all, what we see is the blister. And this is more than just a standard blister. This is actually sort of a raised clear surface kind of blister through which you can see sort of a milky type of fluid underneath within that blister, which is actually pus. And it tends to be firm and sort of rubbery rather than something that is easily breakable and certainly more liquid filled than, for example, a pimple would be. And here are some other images. These blisters tend to have a characteristic dot in the middle of them, which is called umbilication because someone once thought it looked like the belly button or umbilicus of a blister. And here are some images on folks of different skin color, because I think it's important to show blisters as they appear in different skin pigmentation. You can see that these blisters can be fairly diffuse. There can be just a few scattered across the body, or they can be completely covering the skin surface from the head down to the soles of the feet. And here are some others. And then this is, a, again, a more characteristic pus-filled blister on an individual's thumb. So for those of us who do OBGYN management, these kind of blisters can be easily confused for other genital infections in women, many of which are sexually transmitted infections like herpes and syphilis and something called molluscum contagiosum, which is a blister lesion that is associated with sexual transmission. And there are some specific rashes that occur in pregnancy that this can sometimes be confused with. That is why anytime someone who is pregnant comes to one of us asking about new blisters or lesions that they've seen in their genital area, we will do testing for traditional sexually transmitted infections, but we will also talk to patients about the possibility of whether this could be a monkeypox exposure or contact, and we would do appropriate testing to ideally exclude it as a possibility. So why is it that OBGYNs are concerned and involved regarding making a diagnosis of and managing monkeypox because we do know that right now the majority of the infections have been reported in men. However, infections have been reported in women and OBGYNs are very commonly the first or primary route of entry into medical care for a significant proportion of women. They use us as their primary medical doctors. So we need to be able to recognize the symptoms and recognize the lesions to make sure that a diagnosis is not missed. In addition, especially in pregnancy, we know that pregnant women are at risk for more severe disease compared to someone who's not pregnant if they were to develop this infection, that they have higher rates of poor pregnancy outcomes if they are infected during pregnancy, and also infection during pregnancy can cause infection in the fetus and the newborn, which can be very severe. This is a map showing where in the world monkeypox has been reported in this current outbreak. Now monkeypox traditionally, the earlier cases up until this year were in the central and western parts of Africa, and that's in the blue. The rest of these circles globally demonstrate this recent outbreak where monkeypox has been diagnosed in many parts of the globe outside its traditional areas. And the size of the circle shows you the number of cases. So that here in the United States, we have the most cases globally of any other country, but many countries in South America and in Europe have also reported cases in areas where monkeypox had never really been seen. In the United States here, to date as of last week, and right now I'm talking to you on the 12th of September, 
and these numbers will change, but as of last week, my time, there were almost 22,000 cases of monkeypox that had been reported in the United States since the beginning of this outbreak in May. And you can see that while the numbers of cases have gone up and down, and there's been some word now that the numbers might be starting to stabilize, we're still seeing as of last week, my time, that these numbers are not down to zero and they're still much higher than we would like them to be. Here in California, as of the most recent data collection that have been reported in our state, we see that there have been over 4,000 cases reported across our state. A week before, there were only 3,800. So these cases are still increasing, although perhaps a bit less rapidly than they had been. And Los Angeles and San Francisco counties here in our state have the most number of cases. When we look at the ages of people who have been infected, it's predominantly individuals between the ages of 25 and 45. Now, when we get into folks who are 50 and older, we need to remember that one of the vaccines that is currently being used to protect people against monkeypox was actually developed to protect people against smallpox. But since smallpox was eradicated from the world in 1980, no one in the United States has received a smallpox vaccine since 1972. So that anyone who is under the age of 50 will have zero residual immunity from a childhood vaccine. And it's questionable whether even someone who's in their 60s would still have adequate immunity from a shot they got as a child. When we look at who it is here in our state, and this is from California, we see that the majority of individuals who have been getting monkey, who've been infected with monkeypox are men, but we still see that almost 2% of the cases in the state are women. 70 women in the state have been confirmed to be infected with monkeypox. And just a week ago, there were 56 women. So that's a 25% increase in infections in women in just the past week. So this is something that we still need to be aware of and watchful for, and to be certain that we're not going to miss a diagnosis. And on this slide, for those of you who would like to keep track of monkeypox cases in our state or nationally, you can click on the link at the bottom of this slide and go to either of these websites for national or for statewide data as they evolve, and these sites will have the most current case counts for a, any particular area nationally or within our state. Now, in terms of monkeypox infection and pregnancy, we really have not a great deal of data about how much monkeypox infection in pregnancy is like what had been reported before smallpox was eradicated regarding smallpox infection in pregnancy, which we knew was a very bad thing. To date, we have only five cases of monkeypox infection in pregnancy that have been reported. They all have come from Africa before the current outbreak here in the United States and elsewhere in the world. And to date, there were five laboratory confirmed cases. Of those, three of the pregnancies were lost. One pregnancy delivered prematurely and the newborn had diffuse evidence of monkeypox infection at the time of delivery and unfortunately did very poorly after birth. And only one of those inf infected pregnancies resulted in a healthy full-term newborn. Now, this needs to be taken in consideration with the fact that the current outbreak is thought to be with a form of the monkeypox virus that appears to be a bit less severe than the one that was circulating in Africa at the time these reports were published. However, we still don't have many 
published or reported data regarding monkeypox in pregnancy in the current outbreak. There have been no confirmed cases to date in the United States, and none to date have been reported elsewhere in Europe, Canada, or South America. However, if we use smallpox as an example, we would worry that like smallpox, pregnant women who are infected with monkeypox are at risk for more severe disease, higher rates of death, and greater risks of hemorrhage or bleeding into these lesions that can cause much more severe illness in the infected person. We also know, as I mentioned, that pregnancy outcomes with infections with other viruses in the same family have shown higher rates of pregnancy loss, infection of the fetus and the newborn, and premature delivery. As I mentioned before, vaccination programs let us eliminate smallpox globally by 1980, and the last vaccinations in the U.S. occurred in 1972. What we are concerned about with the current monkeypox outbreak is that the largest series of pregnancies in which the woman was infected with smallpox that was reported back in the 60s showed that of all the women who were infected earlier than 24 weeks or six months, three quarters of those pregnancies miscarried. Of those who were infected later, over half of them delivered prematurely. And unfortunately, 10% of the pregnancies resulted in stillbirth. Almost 10% of newborns had congenital or newborn infection that they were delivered with, and all of those infected newborns passed away. And pregnant women who were unvaccinated against smallpox who got it during the pregnancy were two to four times more likely to die during the pregnancy than people who had been vaccinated. So this historical set of data is what makes us concerned about the potential risks for monkeypox in pregnant women should they become infected with this current outbreak and why you're here to learn more about it and why we're here to tell you how important it is to us. Now there are treatments and vaccines available. None of them are specific to monkeypox and they had been developed against smallpox. The one that is in the news right now is an antiviral medication called Tecoviramat, or colloquially called TPOX. And that is a very uh, effective antiviral treatment against smallpox and appears to be very effective against decreasing the severity of infection uh, in individuals who are um, showing signs of monkeypox. And we also have vaccines that are available, both to prevent the disease and to protect someone after they've had a significant contact or exposure. Now, the current vaccines were the ones that were developed against smallpox, and they're using a cousin of the smallpox vaccine called Vaccinia. The data so far suggests that it is a good option to try to protect against monkeypox. There's about an 85% protective effect when individuals are given this vaccine prior to exposure. The brand name of the vaccine is called Geneos, and it uses an inactivated virus, like many other vaccines that are used to protect people against infections, as two doses a month apart, and the peak immunity has been shown to occur about 28 days after the second dose. This type is of vaccine is safe for use in pregnancy. This format of a vaccine has been shown to be used safely to protect against other viral infections. And this would be the first line choice for a woman who is pregnant, who has a significant exposure, or is in a situation where they might be exposed more than uh, other individuals. There is a second vaccine that is available. 
but because it uses a different type of virus to create immunity that is a live virus that can multiply in the body, this other vaccine is not used during pregnancy. There are treatments that are available both before exposure and after exposure. So for what's called pre-exposure prophylaxis, that uh, Geneos vaccine is the one that would be recommended for eligible pregnant and breastfeeding individuals. And then for post-exposure prophylaxis, if someone were to have a significant, close, prolonged contact exposure with someone who either did not inform them about an infection or subsequently realized that they had been infected, then the, the first dose of that vaccine is given within four days of that exposure, then protection appears to be fairly good. If the vaccine isn't given till after four days, but up till 14 days after the exposure, then it probably will not prevent the infection, but should significantly decrease the severity of the illness. We have not yet seen any pregnant women on labor and delivery with monkeypox infections, fortunately, but we would say that we would manage infected pregnant women similarly to the way that we manage other pregnancies that are uh, complicated by other infections with viruses. The major risk would be an impact on how well the fetus is growing. So monitoring the fetal growth as the pregnancy proceeded would be important. And also doing fetal heart rate monitor testing to make sure that the placenta is functioning adequately and supplying the fetus normally would be standard. We have no data on whether how a pregnancy is delivered has an impact on whether the fetus is infected if the mother is infected. Um, there's no data and we would recommend against empirically delivering someone early simply because of an infection. And um, the only question that folks are beginning to discuss is if a woman has a genital monkeypox infection around the time of delivery, then it might be reasonable to at least consider offering her a C-section because it is possible just like the genital lesions that are associated with herpes, that if the fetus is delivered across those lesions, it may have a higher risk of picking up the disease through the birth canal but that would really be the only scenario in which we would absolutely consider recommending cesarean delivery. After delivery, we're recommending that the newborn be at least for the initial period of time separated from the mother if she has active lesions and individuals would be counseled about the risk of transmission and the potential for severe disease if the newborn acquires it. And if it is desired uh, by the parents that they have contact with the newborn while the mother is still infectious, then the newborn would need to be fully clothed and swaddled and the patient would need to not have any active lesions visible or uh, touchable um, during the time of handling the newborn. Breastfeeding would depend upon whether or not an individual had lesions on the breast. At the time, nursing was a consideration. We would recommend against nursing if a pregnant or just delivered person had breast lesions related to monkeypox, although we would recommend contacting lactation support services so that folks could uh, understand how to pump and keep breastfeeding as an option after the infectious period has passed. So in summary, monkeypox fortunately is still an uncommon infection in this country overall, and it is even less common among women, as you've seen. Still, there is nothing to say that prolonged close contact as a source of infection is limited to men in contact with men, and women are certainly reporting and having infections con confirmed here in the country and here in the state. 
so that we as OBGYNs are trying to be as educated and informed as possible about this possibility to make sure that you get the appropriate care and management that you need. Monkeypox infection can be confused with other causes of fever and illnesses that cause rashes. And we are trying our best to recognize what this infection looks like and to have a very low threshold for testing if there's any concern that an infection with monkeypox could be present. This infection can coexist with other infections like sexually transmitted infections. We know that early recognition can help prevent further spread of the disease to contacts of infected individuals. And if a person is pregnant, transmission from that person to her fetus and newborn. And we also stress that vaccination and treatment options should be offered and absolutely not be withheld from pregnant and breastfeeding persons when they are otherwise indicated. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention during this talk. Please feel free to contact our department if you have any additional questions, and we are here to protect you and help you and your families. Thank you.